The Indo-Pacific Visions Vodcast is an official product of the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs. The program fosters intellectual, international discourse on a wide array of topics associated with the Indo-Pacific region, including international relations, foreign policy, national security, allies and partners, geoeconomics, military history, and more. It envisions an inclusive Indo-Pacific that spans from the west coasts of the Americas to the eastern shores of Africa and from Antarctica to the Arctic and covering much of Asia and all of Oceania. Disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed or implied in this vodcast are those of the authors and should not be construed as carrying the official sanction of the Department of Defense, Department of the Air Force, Air Education and Training Command, Air University, or other agencies or departments of the U.S. government or their international equivalents. This is the Indo-Pacific Visions vodcast. In this, our first episode, Dr. Vanda Nabatia, a senior researcher and writer with the Consortium of Indo-Pacific Researchers, interviews Dr. Frank O'Donnell, the deputy director of the Stimson Center's South Asia program. Hi, everyone. Today, we have the pleasure to uh, interview Dr. Frank O'Donnell. It's a pleasure on the behalf of uh, the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs to welcome him and uh, hear his perspectives on the China-India relations. And uh, to, just to introduce uh, Dr. Donnell, he is the deputy director of the Stimson Center South Asia program. His areas of expertise include nuclear doctrine and posture development, conventional military modernization, and national security policymaking processes in Southern Asia. He is also a postdoctoral fellow in the National Security Affairs Department at the U.S. Naval War College. And earlier, he was a Stanton Junior Faculty Fellow and Associate at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University. He has also been an Assistant Professor at the Britannia Royal Naval College and has, and has also held research positions at the University of Aberdeen and James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies. He holds PhD in Defense Studies from the King's College London, as well as an MSc in Strategic Studies from the University of Aberdeen. He has co-authored a book, India and Nuclear Asia, evaluating the inadvertent and accidental escalation risks within the China, India, Pakistan trilateral nuclear rivalry. And he has also authored a book on Indian nuclear force developments and their relevance for the US regional strategic interests. And his articles have been published in several journals uh, like Asian Security, Asian Survey, Comparative Strategy, Compar Contemporary Security Policy, Orbis, and Survival Journals. So let's welcome, let's welcome Dr. Frank O'Donnell and it's again, it's a great pleasure to uh, have you here. Thank you very much for taking out your time to share your views on uh, Sino-India relations. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Batia. Uh, great pleasure to be here and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to uh, begin with, you know, uh, for the viewers who are not very familiar with the Sino-India relations, any, uh, you know, like just to give a brief summary, you would like to introduce the topic first? Yes, of course, I'm happy to. So uh, China and India are the only two uh, world powers with a population over a billion people. Um, in their, their own early years of um, independence of post-colonialism, they um, had, I think, uh, definitely a much warmer relationship than they have now. Um, there are famous meetings, for example, such as the, uh, the Bandung Conference, um, which drew a lot of developing countries that were recently gained independence together. And China and India were leaders of that. Uh, since then, over the decades, they have um, not just gone in different directions developmentally, but uh, certain tensions have uh, grown and only deep in between them. One is the um, still unsettled, uh, what's called the, the line of actual control. Um, they're under their disputed border, which still remains unsettled, as well as just um, the 
the continuing and growing tensions between China's general territorial um, ambitions, aspirations, and including the border with China, as we'll get into, but also in terms of uh, maritime ambitions, um, which mm -hmm. begins to conflict with um, those of India. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they still do work together on different topics, and that can be a bit hard sometimes to kind of uh, to, to kind of think of in terms of uh, how, how, how they manage a broader political relationship. They're both mm -hmm. members of different multi-alignments such as the BRICS, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Um, they often act together at, in climate change negotiations. So the relationship is not entirely one of negative rivalry, but um, the negative rivalry is definitely increasing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a very quick uh, brief overview. Happy to go into more detail on anything I just said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting, you know, that it is because uh, that it is not entirely negative rivalry. So interesting to know that because, you know, what we have been watching in the news for last uh, several years um, that, and, uh, you know, it gives an impression that there would be hardly any um, hardly any issues on which they would merge, you know. Uh, okay, so what accounts for the decline in the Sino-India relations over the last 10 years? And how did they manage their relations in the past to avert, you know, the tensions that we see which are emerging now? Yes, so um, in, in, in the past, they averted their tensions by, um, compartmentalizing their, their border dispute from their overall relationship. And that includes uh, economic relations, that includes uh, their position as you know, major developing countries in the UN system. Um, that they, they agreed that they would not allow their border dispute to, um, to become the sole prism uh, through which the relationship is viewed. Um, there, there are, of course, instances and episodes where that has not been possible. So um, one episode which is still uh, very live in the minds of a lot of Indian and Chinese strategists is their 1962 border war um, mm -hmm. in which um, Chinese forces fairly quickly and easily managed to um, overwhelm their Indian forces and inflicted a humiliating defeat on India. And since then, um, while Indian forces have tried to, to bear this in mind and try to find the best defense posture to stop this happening, uh, which I'll get into in a second. At the mm -hmm. same time, at the level of the political leaderships, both states attempted to keep their, not, not to allow that border dispute and the hangover mm -hmm. from the war complicate their relationship. Mm -hmm. So they, as I say, they, they worked on developing economic relations, uh, they worked on partnering together on various issues at the UN, um, but there was this view that the, the border dispute should be comp compartmentalized and that it would be, they, while they would still keep working on it uh, to resolve it peacefully and amicably, um, other elements of the relationship would not be held up by lack of progress on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, a kind of a, a high watermark um, for that in, came in 2005 when uh, China and India struck um, agree, essentially an agreement on what the parameters of a future border settlement agreement would be. Mm -hmm. um, and this in itself is, is, of course, not a settlement of the border issue, but it was still a, a fairly substantive agreement in its own right. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, really, since then, things have declined, and they the first point I would make, probably the primary reason why they have declined are China's growing territorial ambitions and um, its, its sense that its, its time has arrived, that we know that China no longer has to, um, from the Deng Xiaoping famous saying, you know, um, bide its time and wait for conditions to improve before it starts really asserting itself um, strategically. And so as its diplomacy, as its territorial claims have become more blunt, and we see this not just with regard to, to India and the border issue, but also with regard to, as we see in the South China Sea, 
with regard to Taiwan, that has made it more difficult for India, both mm -hmm. India and China, to keep the border issue compartmentalized in that way. And so it has gradually risen in terms of the importance of it, the kind of the military tensions in their mm -hmm. broader relationship. And in more recent years, um, we have seen Indian forces, uh, as I'll probably get to a little bit later, uh, beginning to build to be built up more along their border area with China. Um, we have seen in but much more recently Chinese forces begin to follow suit. But I think the the mutual shared sense that their border could be solved peacefully and amicably through negotiations. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. which kind of underpinned the whole logic of compartmentalization has pretty much gone now in terms of the bilateral trust is no longer there in the relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why we see uh, Sino-Indian relations continuing to decline uh, and worsen and be seen increasingly just through that military prism as military competitors um, compared to what it was in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, what would you attribute, you know, the uh, to the lack of the bilateral trust in the recent years? Uh, would it be the leadership or or any other factor? Yes, I mean, I I would say it's um, it's it's in part that the leadership, although it's you know in China it's um you know it's it's been the leadership of Hu Jintao and then into Xi Jinping, so it's not a, it's not a single leader. And uh, similarly in India, um, the time frame I'm talking about is the former Congress-like government of Man Mahan Singh, uh, leading into the BJP-like government of uh, Narendra Modi. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, but what I think has what I think has caused it is uh, China beginning to match um, increasingly aggressive rhetoric on the border with actual aggressive mm -hmm. border actions. So before um, the big uh, Ladakh crisis in 2020, uh, there was an earlier crisis in 2017 over um, an area called Doklam, which is in not in India or China, but which is in, in Bhutan. And mm -hmm. uh, Chinese forces uh, were planning to construct a road that would allow them essentially oversight and the ability to cut off through bombardment uh, what's mm -hmm. referred to in India as the chicken's neck, uh, but which is also known as the Siliguri Corridor. This very mm -hmm. narrow strip of land that connects uh, seven, seven Eastern Indian states uh, from the rest of the mainland, uh, mm -hmm. and which is very easy just by its sheer narrowness to, to, um, to be cut off. Mm -hmm. Indian forces um, recognizing this danger, um, if this border road could be completed, and if China could ship artillery and rockets down that far to bring them within mm -hmm. range, uh, marched into Bhutan and physically stopped uh, China from completing this road. And the, the rhetoric that began to, that then began to emanate from Beijing uh, was definitely out of sync with what we've seen uh, with regard to as I talked about that, that emphasis on compartmentalization. Uh, mm -hmm. We started to hear rhetoric about from China about 1962 and how you know India should have learned its lesson in 1962 and kind of overt um, war signals, war signaling. Mm -hmm. So there was a ferocity there um, that had not been there in previous crises. And there have been, you know, over the years before that, be simply because the border is still not agreed, the line of actual control between India and China, um, instances in which, you know, a Chinese patrol would overstep uh, where India thought the line was and be met by Indian forces and similar with, with India and China on the other side. At times, this would lead to, um, you know, the border patrol simply sitting down and camping for a few weeks and the mean negotiations before they eventually went back. Um, mm -hmm. But this time was different in terms of just the, the ferocity of the reaction from, from China, which then led to uh, necessary Indian counter reactions because this was happening in public. And so um, one of the slogans at the time from the government in India was, you know, the India of 2017 um, is not the India of 1962 that we can, you know, stand up to China and so on. And then um, 
and then that kind of lack of trust only deepened while the the while the while the Dokum crisis itself was peacefully resolved through negotiation in that I think in that there are still you know Chinese and I think I think Indian forces there but um they're not quite as nose to nose as they were previously um the the overarching atmosphere uh between China and India stayed there was an effort by Modi and Xi Jinping to try to reset relations and to set them back to the way that they used to be. Um, there was um, one summit, I believe, in Wuhan and another in uh, Chennai. And um, a lot of you know, promises to improve relations were made, but I think it became fairly clear um, from China's subsequent conduct in more recent years, as we've seen, uh, that these, these were just kind of Chinese efforts to um, lull India into a false sense of security. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, how do you see the Pakistan factor in, you know, the China-India relations and um, even in the context of the emerging naval nuclear competition between India and China and India and Pakistan, you know, how um, does it seem that China is using the Pakistan factor and, you know, both tend to gain from each other, like from the Indian perspective, it seems that both uh, their alliance or their uh, partnership is uh, targeted against India, that, you know, they stand to gain together. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. and to, I'll, I'll just uh, continue on just with one more point from the last answer as well, is that from China's perspective, China has watched um, India grow closer to the United States strategically. Um, mm -hmm since the civil nuclear agreement. And um, they are concerned about the, the effects of this on Chinese security and about being encircled by um, allies or partners of the US. So you, you can kind of see that with India on the West with states like Philippines and then you know um, Japan, South Korea. That's another reason why from China's perspective it's their, their mutual trust with India is declining. The role of Pakistan in this is also um, increasingly complicated, um, but also increasingly vital to understand what's going on. So China has long been a, a strong uh, supporter economically, technologically of Pakistan, especially its, its military and trying to keep Pakistan's military at a level of technological and um, just general parity with that of India despite the, the material um, differences between them in that you know, India's population and economy are multiple times that of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. In more recent years, um, China has of course launched the One Belt, One Road project and in Pakistan, which is probably the most uh, advanced country out, out of all the countries that One Belt, One Road projects are taking place in, uh, the project is called CPAC, China Pakistan Economic Corridor. And uh, within that, uh, there are plans for a huge number of um, upgrades to, base, to basic Pakistani infrastructure, uh, but which are also relevant for uh, military operations. Um, railroads is one, for example, in terms of a, a, just a stronger rail distribution network, which could also be useful for ferrying troops. But I think what's of greater, probably the, the element that's of greatest importance and which um, analysts watch most closely is the, the establishment of a new deep water port at Gwadar in southwestern Pakistan, uh, sitting on the Arabian Sea. Uh, this is for, at the start, it was being talked about by Chinese and uh, Pakistan officials as being um, solely a civilian port for in increasing Pakistan's, um, ci you know, civilian economy through increased access to, to uh, maritime trade through having a 21st century port facility. Uh, but since then, it has become increasingly obvious that this is also going to have mil military significance. And so a challenge for India is that to essentially for Chinese, uh, for the PLA Navy to be able to reach Gwadar they have to go around India and the, the traffic route necessarily involves them um, coming close to Indian shores to be able to circ around India to get to it. Another element of this um, is 
going back to the same logic of China trying to uh, make sure that uh, Pakistan has parity with, with India is that China has watched India successfully after decades finally launch its uh, nuclear armed submarine program. And it is helping Pakistan uh, with uh, similar plans. Uh, analysts I've spoken to have said that there, there, there is a, I believe it's the type 041 uh, diesel electric submarine um, of which Pakistan and China concluded a deal a few years ago for eight to be uh, purchased by Pakistan. And that this is the most likely um, submarine based platform for India's um, nuclear armed submarine force. There would have to be quiet modifications made to the typo for one for this to happen. Um, but that is another element of that as well. And that is going to be based out of um, one of either Karachi or, or Gwadar essentially. Mm -hmm. And um, in this broader context, you know, India, China, and Pakistan are all either fielding or have fielded nuclear armed submarines, um, but there is no real strategic dialogue among the three states about um, what to do if um, a nuclear armed vessel comes into contact with another. Um, there's nothing such as the, uh, the US Soviet incidents at sea agreement. There are no protocols as to what happens uh, if, you know, um, essentially a nuclear armed vessel is challenged by, it could be a conventional armed vessel, a nuclear armed vessel, but how you essentially de-escalate and not make uh, the nuclear armed vessel feel that it is being threatened. And um, with the kind of uh, corollary dangers of um, being seen back by its host capital that um, the military of this state is trying to um, block or interfere or worse with a nuclear armed vessel of ours and um, the nuclear implications of that. Yeah, this is uh, interesting points that you're, you know, you've raised that there is no, uh, so far no talk about any kind of a strategic dialogue and you know how to de-escalate and what should be the protocol followed. Uh, interesting, interesting points. And um, how do you see Quad, you know, uh, the response of China, um, to Quad and you know imp its impact on Sino-India relations, India's yes. in the Quad and um... yes, uh, the Quad for China does tie into these these broader anxieties that it has about um, encirclement, and so um, I should have mentioned Australia, of course, in a previous answer, in my previous answer about you know the different U.S. partners and allies that are uh, from China's perspective encircling it. And so it feeds into their perception that um, the United States is orchestrating um, uh, a ring of allies and partners that are designed to constrain China, that are designed to keep it safe, for example, from uh, breaking out uh, militarily. So say, for example, having um, a true, you know, uh, blue water naval capability able to militarily move wherever it wants um, around the globe questions about, you know, whether or not the Quad would become involved if China was to militarily try to take Taiwan, um, elements of that. So simply by its existence, um, it, and, and just the clear, I mean, the clear subtext of the Quad is while it does, you know, work on important things like, you know, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, um, there are discussions now about, um, you know, a quad program for COVID vaccinations and COVID relief and things like that. The, the underlying logic of it, and I, I feel most of the discussions around it are about the rise of China and what they can collectively do um, around this. And so that does, by the fact of, it, of its existence, that does in a way um, worsen uh, Sino-Indian relations. However, it wouldn't, it wouldn't if uh, China didn't have such grand uh, territorial ambitions and such a increasingly blunt way of pursuing them. So we do see, for example, you know, interest from Quad members in greater cooperation um, correlating pretty, pretty, pretty frequently with um, an uptick in Chinese aggression. And um, in, in, in 
in periods where China is uh, relatively um, more diplomatic, um, there are, um, you don't see as much progress in quant development. So in that way, you know, there's no greater um, motivator, there's no greater builder of the quad uh, than China by itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, in the recent, you know, context of the Ukraine-Russia crisis, um, it's quite surprising um, to say that uh, India and China, you know, they are on the same side of the issue, you know, and an uh, issue which is a uh, uh, which has impacts um, throughout the world. And they have interestingly, and you know, probably um, never witnessed before that they are on the same side. So how would you explain this uh, situation that India and China, you know, sort of supporting Russia? Yeah, uh, it, it is, it is, a, it's a fascinating, um... It's, it's a fascinating topic and it's, it's a very interesting question. Um, I would say that China and India have been on the same side before. So if I remember correctly, um, it's certainly in their, in their BRICS summits um, during and after the Russian invasion of Crimea and of Eastern Ukraine, uh, there was no mention of this at all in BRICS statements. Um, so it's not, you know, condemning, mm -hmm. it's not supporting, <clears throat> it's abstaining in a way. Mm -hmm. I want to also say that um, at the efforts to bring this, the 2014 um, Crimea, Eastern Ukraine invasion to the UN Security Council that uh, China and India abstained. And so this is because they both have, they, they both have, uh, different needs uh, from Russia and their relationship, uh, but, the, but those needs are very important. And so going forward to, to today, when we see China and India both abstaining, they are they, certainly they're both abstaining in, in voting um, against Russia at the UN Security Council and in just in other opportunities. Um, but they're doing so because they they both want different things and they both have different factors playing in, in mind when they cast these votes. For China first, uh, China and Russia have um, really, it's a, a multidimensional strategic partnership uh, that the scholar Stephen Blank, um, who wrote an article, I think, I believe it's called the Unholy Alliance, um, which I will I will send to you and could, could perhaps be, you know, be posted. Um, um, on you know on the page for this for this interview, which I highly recommend that it, it should be widely read. Um, a multidimensional strategic partnership that he argues in many ways is actually more effective than an actual formal alliance agreement with a mutual defense commitment because not having that mutual defense commitment in a way frees both Russia and China to um, adjust how they respond uh, together to threats facing one or both of them. Uh, without that, without being pre-committed in that way. Um, China and Russia both um, are, are very strong partners. They both um, oppose the U.S. Uh, they both oppose the U.S. roles in their respective priority areas, you know, for China, um, Asia, and the, um, the Indian Ocean, for Russia, uh, Western Europe. Um, and so, and Russia is, has also been an important arms supplier for China, although I think that the, the, the qualitative capability of Chinese arms is, is now surpassing that of Russia. Um, China does need to have Russia as generally a strategic partner because China does have few of these. If you think about the kinds of states that China can generally count on and it has a similar relationship with Russia, there's none with the equivalent power. And I think the closest other ones you can think of might be Pakistan, North Korea, states like this. There are very few. Mm -hmm. And so um, and so China abstains uh, from voting kind of on that basis because it wants to, it simply does need to have a strong Russia relationship. India abstains because India, I think first and foremost, has had a, a long history of um, generous uh, arms support from Russia to India. 
Um, the estimates range from some people have estimated 50% uh, uh, a Simpson Center team that I was part of, which published an, an, an article in the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs, I believe, uh, the start of last year, estimated as high as 85% of India's um, all, all of its armed services of its actual just military capabilities are of Russian or Soviet origin. And uh, it is reliant upon Russia for um, just the kind of the maintenance, the spare parts, um, servicing um, upon having access to uh, Russian military factories and the Russian military um, for that to continue and for its armed forces to continue to be uh, ready. And um, Russia can, if it wishes to do so, um, really put restraints on India's ability to access those. And so India does have a, a strong interest in, in at least abstaining from from Russian, overtly criticizing Russia on its actions here to keep that important um, relationship uh, going with regard to that. Mm -hmm. Another element that does factor in uh, to Indian calculations is that um, Russia has traditionally um, used its veto power at the UN to uh, protect um, and in a, in a way uh, safeguard India from having um, Pakistan uh, raise Kashmir as an issue to be considered by the UN Security Council. Uh, Russia will regularly um, veto or all but veto in saying we, we wouldn't allow this to progress um, any, any attempts to discuss this in recent years at the UN Security Council. And so having um, a state that can do that for India is not something that comes around easily. And uh, thirdly, the, the Russia relationship for India also ties into um, how India thinks about its relationship with China. India mm -hmm. has for a long time sought to persuade Russia that it doesn't have to put all its, um, put all its eggs in the China basket, that instead of having this close bilateral singular partnership with China, it could have um, a looser relationship um, with, you know, a looser relationship with China, but then also um, a, a, what would be a stronger relationship with India, but to have roughly equivalent relations with both states, or in an, in an ideal world, uh, choose India as an exclusive partner. And uh, from hopeful Indian perspectives, that Moscow would kind of wake up and realize that uh, China is does see itself as being the Eurasian hegemon, and that um, it would serve Moscow's interests better for it to more closely partner with New Delhi against China. So it doesn't mm -hmm. want to do anything that, in India's view, forces uh, Russia more closely into China's arms in that respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And. Uh... Do you see any uh, role uh, that Russia can play in, you know, the Sino-India relations? Uh, do you see any? Yes. You know? did, did, you have, did you have more to that question? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, yes, there, there is. Um, one final part, which I should have mentioned the last area, is that um, the last question is that Another reason why India continues to engage and want a strong relationship with Russia is so that Russia could, could potentially serve that mediatory role uh, with China. Um, in the Doklam crisis of 2017, which we talked about earlier, and the Ladakh crisis of 2020, uh, Indian diplomats, the Indian prime minister did uh, and have regularly reached out to Putin to ask him to make a statement in support of India's position to strongly lobby China to, to back down militarily and uh, to, to step back using its good relationship with both India and China to do so. I think during the time of the Doklam crisis, there was um, some more successful Russian lobbying, um, partly on India's behalf that helped bring about the, the de-escalation with Doklam. Um, I haven't seen much evidence of that happening with the 2020 Ladakh crisis in terms of Russia being willing to do this on India's behalf and with the risk for Russia of um, angering China and forcing China to or 
creating the conditions where Russia could cut off uh, various financial military support for Russia. So mm -hmm. Russia could serve this role, uh, but I think it's an indicator of the changing, I would say, balance of power within the Sino-Russian relationship that Russia no longer feels that it is either able or willing to, to do so. Mm -hmm. So as I understand that it would also be abstaining in the Sino-India relations that Russia, like the approach that India and China have uh, employed of abstaining. Yes, um, actually it's, you know, it's the language that Russia employs with regard to China and India is remarkably similar to that which India employs uh, with Russia and Ukraine at the UN. And mm -hmm. I believe okay. urging that, you know, that the, the dispute be resolved by peaceful dialogue. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's the Russian diplomatic stance on these China-Indian military tensions. And that's, um, that's, that's the language that, in, that India also uses, not just with regard to Russia and Ukraine, but the, as you know, that that's fairly kind of common language for that go along with abstention votes in general. But that's, mm -hmm. that's Russia's position on, uh, on China. And um, I don't see any sign that that's going, going to shift Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And uh, coming back to China and India relations per se, what measures you think that uh, both the nations can undertake to improve their relationship? What is your forecast for their relationship? And, uh, you know, um, do you see any regional or global impacts uh, of the of your forecast for their relationship? Absolutely. So uh, measures that China and India could take to improve the relationship because China is the stronger power and because um, it, has, it has also settled, um, formally settled its borders with, I believe, every state surround, every state um, adjacent to it except India. Um, the first step has to come from China and having just a generally changed approach toward India. Um, the first things which would ideally take place would be that China would withdraw back from um, withdraw its forces and the, the more permanent kind of bases that seem to be being established um, within the, the areas of the line of actual control that it has occupied since 2020 to dismantle those, to move back um, to its previous position and to really sit down with India and finalize the border once and for all, including uh, giving up, um, as it has with, with other states uh, surrounding China, giving up um, elements of uh, territory that China has claimed as its own um, um, as part of that deal, if that's what it takes to for that deal to, to finally happen. That would probably be the strongest single thing that China could do if it, A, wanted to um, really improve relations with India, uh, and to be honest, B, if it really wanted to weaken the Quad um, in that there's mm -hmm. no greater motivator for greater Quad cooperation than Chinese aggression. And by a final border resolution, that I think would take a lot of the steam out of uh, India's willingness to adopt a more aggressive stance uh, toward China and, and also as being that as part of the Quad. Um, then after that, I, I think that would be the biggest kind of first step. And then after that, there are different, different elements that you know, would have to be tackled. Um, you know, China's relationship with Pakistan is a continuing uh, source of concern for India. Um, ways to um, ways to discuss that, have strategic dialogues around that. But that, but that's the first thing. Um, in terms of you know forecasts for the future of the relationship, um, I don't see this happening. Um, in part due to, to be honest, just Chinese uh, domestic politics. Uh, Xi Jinping is definitely trying to show that um, he is an assertive uh, global leader, that he will not back down from military claims, that he not be bullied by any other country. 
in part of the what I understand to be the real ferocity and rage that emanated from Beijing in, in the 2017 Dulcum crisis was the publicity around it and the sense from China that it was being humiliated by India and the Indian forces could successfully block uh, Chinese road construction. And that uh, now, you know, China does not want that to ever happen again. And the, the occupation of Ladakh uh, since 2020 and is, is part of that, is just sending India that, that signal. I unfortunately see things continuing to decline uh, between China and India. Um, I believe we now have had the 14th or 15th official meeting to discuss a couple of days ago to discuss the, the, the Ladakh occupation that I don't think has resolved anything substantive. Um, the Quad continues to gather steam, as I say, due to China's own actions. Um, China feels uh, threatened by you know, what it sees as its own encirclement. And um, the Russia sanctions are also playing into this, and the Russia element is playing into this, and in that as Russia is in increasingly cut off from the global financial system, from the dollar-based financial system, it has no choice but to be moved, pushed closer to, to China. And so the window, I think, for India to, to be able to persuade Russia to partner with India instead of China is pretty much closed now, as far as you can, you know, as, as far as I, as I can see. And so the China-India relationship will continue to grow in, in tensions, uh, the divide will continue to grow. And also the, the China-Russia partnership will also grow more cohesive um, against Indian interests. Mm -hmm. The regional mm -hmm. and global impacts from this are that we will, I think, just genuinely see this um, worsening of their, of not just the, you know, the China-Indian relationship, but just of tensions around uh, China's rise in global, in global politics. And that the, as I said at the start, you know, the, the level of trust that underpinned the previous approach of compartmentalization um, has now gone between China and India. Um, I, I think as we can see um, with the US and Russia that any residual trust that um, Russia could ever be brought on side in terms of um, accepting the, the post uh, the post Cold War order in Europe has now gone and that Russia will simply not accept this. And I think that uh, we will see the same uh, with regard to China, that um, China is not going to be uh, held back by um, the US, by India, by any of the forces uh, surrounding it. The way, the way forward is for, you know, increased uh, candid strategic dialogue between China and India and between China and the other states that is locked into various rivalries with. But the initiative does have to come from, from Beijing. And I don't see the kind of, I, I don't see the, the, the logic in Chinese domestic politics for that to happen because um, anything that does, that doesn't look like an absolute di diplomatic win for Xi Jinping is seen as a loss for him, and his position in China domestically is is it's always less stable than people automatically assume. Uh, he does have he does have rivals, um, and so I think he has his own lack of flexibility in that regard. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Um... Also, you know, there's one thing I want to, would like to know, how did you get interested in the Sino-India relations? What captured your interest? Um, Thank you. Yes, um, <laughs> I've, I've been a scholar of South Asia for a long time. And it's simply a factor that um, China is now a permanent actor in South Asia. It's as much a permanent actor now as India or Pakistan is. And so to fully understand what's happening uh, with regard to India's foreign policy and defense and with regard to that in South Asia more broadly, um, you have to understand also what China is, is doing in the region and how it relates to these states. And so I started following this and researching this and studying this um, out of just sheer necessity that to understand what's going on um, mm -hmm. throughout the South Asia, you have to understand what Chinese intentions are for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah, so I would like to thank you uh, for you know presenting your views, a uh, broad variety of views, and um, especially emphasizing that you know there is lack of strategic dialogue that these countries need to come together. Even Pakistan, China, Pakistan, in the context of the nuclear submarines, and you know um, that there is no protocols. How would they de-escalate any issue ar arises? And um, what I also found interesting was that you see that there is scope that there can they can build um, as India and China can have a better relationship like you you know uh, but uh, the initiative will need to come from China and um, but you don't uh, you know foresee it happening like that's like yes it is possible but. For in the near, near future, we don't see that happening. And your perspective on um, Russia's role in India and China is also um, quite apt that it, you know, it will stay away, abstain, um, you know, and we cannot expect it to play a mediator role because of, again, the interests, uh, you know, it has towards both these nations, Russia has towards China and India. So it would, you know, uh, not act as a mediator, but, you know, stay away from that. So any final words you would like to say? It has, it's been really um, um, nice to understand your perspective and in-depth, in-depth analysis and um, perspective on the views on these issues and variety of issues on the quad. Um, on quad, on the nuclear aspects, as well as you know how these two nations can build a better future. Any concluding remarks you would like to place? Um, so, again, just to just to say thank you for um, for the opportunity. I, I really appreciate it, and um, we at the South Asia program are pretty heavily engaged on this topic, as well as um, others to do with Southern Asian security. Um, uh, China's rise in the region, um, India's relations with Russia. We do have an event that is coming up on, I believe it's on March 15th, looking at the um, the, the Russia-Ukraine crisis and what that means for India. Um, mm -hmm. So I would encourage anybody watching who would like to know more to um, to tune into that. It'll be a virtual event. Um, and just, yes, I mean, just, just follow our website and uh, stay tuned because we are very much uh, focusing on this and we'll have a lot of uh, great research coming out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so once again, thank you very much on the behalf of the Journal of India Pacific Affairs for your time, for sharing your views, and it's been really helpful to hear you and uh, get a, a good perspective of the, you know, the um, India China relations and what can be expected in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I appreciate Thank it. You.